Wilbur Wright nervously watched his brother Orville take flight across the tall, sandy dunes of the Kill Devil Hills near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. He likely knew they were making history, but he probably could not have imagined what was to come of their success. Humans had been fascinated with the sky and dreaming of joining the birds long before the first legitimate attempts to fly were made. Early attempts at flight were essentially attempts to mimic bird flight. Early designs were primitive and impractical, but over time they became more complex. The first designs that resembled flying machines were those produced by Leonardo da Vinci in the late 15th century, the most famous being the flapping ornithopter and the helical rotor. And Frenchman Jean-Marie Labrie achieved the first powered flight with his glider pulled by a horse along the beach. After this, throughout the latter part of the 19th century, glider designs got more complicated, and these new styles allowed for more control than their predecessors. By the 17th century, the theory behind balloon flight had started to develop, as Francesco Lana del Terzi began experimenting with pressure differentials. However, it wasn't until the mid-18th century that the Montgolfier brothers developed larger models of the balloon. This led to the first manned hot air balloon flight on November 21, 1783, by Jean-François Pelletre de Rosier and Marquis de Lande in Paris, France. One of the significant innovations in airplane design was introduced by Louis Blériot in 1908. The Frenchman's Blériot 8 aircraft had a monoplane wing set up with a tractor configuration, where the propellers of the plane are situated in front of the engine as opposed to behind it, which had previously been the norm. This configuration resulted in the aircraft being pulled through the air instead of pushed, giving it superior steering. Just a year later, Blériot made history with his latest aircraft, the Blériot 11, by crossing the English Channel, pocketing himself a 1,000 pound prize in the process. As Europe plunged into war in 1914, the exploratory nature of airplane flight gave way to the desire to turn airplanes into machines of war. At the time, the majority of planes were biplanes, and they were used extensively for reconnaissance purposes. This was a very hazardous undertaking, however, as ground fire would often down these relatively slow-moving airplanes. In the years between the two world wars, airplane technology continued to develop. The introduction of air-cooled radial engines, as opposed to water-cooled, meant that engines were more reliable, lighter, and with higher power-to-weight ratio, meaning they could go faster. Monoplane aircraft were now very much the norm. Great progress was made during the 1920s and 30s, such as Charles Lindbergh's solo transatlantic flight in 1927 and Charles Kingsford Smith's Trans-Pacific flight the following year. One of the most successful designs of this period was the Douglas DC-3, which became the first airliner that was profitable carrying passengers exclusively, starting the modern era of passenger airline service. By the 1950s, the development of civil jets grew, beginning with the de Havilland Comet, but because it was much more economical than other planes at the time, the first widely used passenger jet was the Boeing 707. At the time, turboprop propulsion began to appear for smaller commuter planes, making it possible to operate small volume routes in much wider range of weather conditions. By the 1960s, the aerospace industry was coming back to life. International travel increased in popularity and passenger volume increased significantly. The increase in popularity prompted Boeing's release of its first jumbo jet in 1969, the iconic 747. Competition became more intense among the major commercial manufacturers as the demand for aircraft grew. Airbus launched its A300 during this period and proved to be a major competitor for Boeing. 
Since the 1960s, composite airframes and quieter, more efficient engines became available, and the supersonic Concorde provided passenger service for more than two decades. But the most important, lasting innovations have taken place in instrumentation and control. The arrival of solid-state electronics and global positioning systems, satellite communications and increasingly small and powerful computers and LED displays have dramatically changed the cockpits of airliners and increasingly of smaller aircraft as well. Pilots can navigate much more accurately and view terrain, obstructions and other nearby aircraft on a map or through synthetic vision, even at night or in low visibility. Since the start of the new millennium, aircraft manufacturers have enjoyed steady and rising revenues driven by increased air passenger traffic. Another key factor in the industry's growth during this period is the increase in traffic originating from emerging economies such as Latin America, China and India. As these economies continue to develop, the demand for air traffic is expected to rise even further. But few aircraft in the history of civil aviation has had a more profound impact than the legendary Douglas DC-3. In 1934, one year before the introduction of the DC-3, a flight from New York to Los Angeles was a grueling ordeal, typically requiring 25 hours, more than one airline, at least two changes of planes, and as many as 15 stops or so. When the DC-3 entered commercial service, a single plane could cross the country, usually stopping only three times to refuel. According to F. Robert van der Linden, curator of aeronautics at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, the DC-3 is widely considered to be the first airliner capable of making money just by carrying passengers. Built by Douglas Aircraft, founded in 1921, the DC-3 incorporated breakthroughs developed at Douglas and Boeing, such as 1200 horsepower supercharged twin engines, cantilevered metal wings, and retractable landing gear. But the legacy of the DC-3 is that it captured America's imagination. The journey became the destination, and with good reason. Passengers aboard the plane entered a world inconceivable to today's beleaguered air traveler. Once airborne, passengers were offered cocktails, followed by entree choices such as sirloin steak and Long Island duckling, served on fine Syracuse china with Reed and Barton silverware. At cruising altitude, the captain on occasion would have strolled the aisle and chatted with the passengers who were called visitors or guests. Transcontinental sleeper flights featured curtained berths with goose-down comforters and feathered mattresses. During the pre-World War II era, when the nation began dreaming of air travel, the runaway appeal of the DC-3, whether fitted with berths or only with seats, convinced Americans to take to the skies in record numbers. In 1940, more than 2 million Americans made trips by air. Cost per mile for the consumer decreased from 5.7 cents in 1935 to 5 cents. Round-trip coast-to-coast flights were pricey at $300, the equivalent of $4,918 today. But business customers in particular flocked to take advantage of the time saving. Another icon of the modern jet age was the Boeing 707, the first successful commercial passenger jetliner. The mid to long range, narrow bodied, four engine aircraft with swept wing design was developed and manufactured by the Boeing Company. It made the first flight on December 20, 1957, and entered commercial service on October 26, 1958. It remained in production until 1991, with a total of 1,010 being built, and was credited with inaugurating the jet age in commercial travel. Its first commercial flight in 1958 was from New York City to Paris and took 8 hours and 41 minutes, including a stop for refueling in Gander, Newfoundland, Canada. 
Its improvements over earlier planes in passenger capacity, range and speed revolutionized air travel, and it came to be used by American Airlines for most domestic and transatlantic flights throughout the 1960s. The last scheduled Boeing 707 flight in the United States was a Transworld Airlines flight from Miami to New York City in 1983. Second-tier airlines in the rest of the world continue to fly the 707s, however, Saha Airlines of Iran used Boeing 707s for its passenger service until 2013, after which commercial use of the 707 ceased. The impact of the airplane and modern aviation as a whole is undeniable. It is one of the main drivers of globalization, driving the development of the modern world. A network of airlines, airports and air traffic management organizations link the major cities and small communities of the world 24 hours a day with increasingly advanced aircraft. Aviation supports 65.5 million jobs worldwide and enables $2.7 trillion in global GDP. It allows people to have adventures in new countries, to relax on tropical beaches, to build business relationships and to visit friends and family. As our global economy grows ever more linked, aviation is the factor that brings people together. Aviation, if it were a country, would be the 20th largest economy in the world. And it all began with two brothers, Orville and Wilbur Wright, on December 17, 1903, at Kitty Hawk, where they achieved the first successful flight in history of a self-propelled, heavier-than-air aircraft. At 10.35 a.m., Orville piloted the gasoline-powered propeller-driven biplane called the Flyer, which stayed aloft for 12 seconds and covered 120 feet on its inaugural flight, and thus the modern aviation age was born. While we marvel at the great achievements made in these early days of manned flight, we barely give a second thought to simply booking a flight to wherever we may happen to want or need to travel today. But it is important to remember that the innovations and advancements that made modern air travel possible were the product of engineering and aviation development with only one purpose, to rain death and destruction on the enemy during World War II the deadliest conflict in history. World War I was the first major conflict involving the large-scale use of aircraft. Initially, they were used mostly for reconnaissance. Pilots and engineers learned from experience, leading to the development of many specialized types, including fighters, bombers, and trench strafers. Ace fighter pilots were portrayed as modern knights and became popular heroes. Aces like Billy Bishop of the Royal Air Force, Baron Manfred von Richthofen of the German Imperial Air Service, René Funk of France's Aeronautique Militaire, and Eddie Rickenbacker of the U.S. Army Air Service, to name a few. Their planes gained equally spectacular reputations as exceptional machines of disguise. Planes like the Newport 28, flown by Rickenbacker, the Newport 17, flown by Billy Bishop, the Spad S7, flown by Funk, and the Fokker DR1 triplane, flown by Richthofen. While the impact of aircraft on the course of the war was mainly tactical rather than strategic, the first steps in the strategic roles of aircraft in future wars were made. During World War II, aviation became a crucial weapon of modern warfare. From the Battle of Britain to dropping atomic bombs on Japan, much of World War II was fought in the skies. Investment in aircraft technology during this time drove the aviation industry in general forward in leaps and bounds, paving the way for the modern aircraft used in passenger operations today. One of the first and most notable advances was, of course, the monoplane. The streamlined, cantilevered monoplane design really came into its own in the Second World War. Although some biplanes remained in service throughout the war, the design of new aircraft largely lent toward the clean, unbraced monoplane wing design. 
The use of lightweight metals such as aluminum alloys accelerated as well, as did the use of enclosed cockpits and variable pitch propellers. Designed for World War II, the Spitfire was an incredible development for aviation. Small, light and maneuverable, this single-seat fighter aircraft spearheaded developments in engine and aerodynamic technologies, much of which has gone on to influence passenger planes in the future. Another development was pressurization. The largest Allied bomber of World War II was the Boeing B-29 Superfortress. Responsible for the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, this aircraft was also one of the first aircraft to use pressurized cabins, which protected the crew from sub-zero temperatures and reduced air pressure and oxygen when flying long-range bombing missions and is something we all rely on today for long-distance, high-altitude flying. But one of the most profound advancements of World War II aviation was the development of the jet engine. However, German and British engine technologies were developing quite differently. The Germans opted for the axial flow jet, where air passes continuously through the engine. The British, in contrast, worked on the development of a centrifugal compressor where air is pushed outwards to compress before it returned to the turbine. Although the centrifugal compressor was more successful during the war, its requirement for a large face area made it unsuitable for widespread rollout due to the drag produced. As such, the German actual flow design is the one that has inspired practically all jet engines today. The first operational jet fighter in the world was the German ME262. Capable of some 559 miles per hour, it went into service with the Luftwaffe in 1944. This new technology allowed planes to fly higher and faster than ever before and paved the way for jet engine developments in passenger aircraft around the world. The Gloucester Meteor was the first jet aircraft to serve in squadrons of the RAF. Coming into service during World War II, the Meteor was the only Allied jet involved in combat during the conflict. The Germans, who had been ahead of the competitors in rocket technology, fielded jets such as the Messerschmitt Me 262 and the Heinkel He 162 Salamander. However, the air war was mostly fought using propeller-driven planes. Despite Germany's technological advantage, the Meteor was the first operational jet flying in the world. It became the history-making plane after beating an ME-262 into squadron service by a few days. The Meteor was designed by George Carter, who began work on the project in 1940. Jet engines available for Carter's project had relatively poor thrust. He therefore equipped the plane with a pair of engines, one in each wing, to give it enough power. At first, the Meteor was built using W-2B turbojets designed by Frank Whittle. They proved to be too weak and the plane could not take off. They were replaced by a pair of Halford H-1 engines, which powered the first flight by a Meteor. Other engines were tried in a variety of prototypes as the designers attempted to create a plane with the necessary power and speed. Eventually, they settled on a pair of Rolls-Royce W2B-23 Welland engines, which produced 1,700 pounds of thrust. They powered the flight of the fourth Meteor prototype in June 1943, and became the engines for the production model that followed. Following the D-Day landings, Hitler had ordered strikes against Britain by V-1 flying bombs. Their sudden appearance out of the clear skies caused terror and destruction in the south of England. Number 616 Squadron was sent to counter them. These first sorties by meteors revealed problems with their guns, but that did not stop daring pilots from taking on the V-1s. On August 4, 1944, Flying Officer Dean used his plane to tip over a V-1 in flight 
after his guns malfunctioned. By the end of August, the problem with the guns had been sorted. Including Flying Officer Dean's actions, they destroyed 13 flying bombs in the space of a month. The Allies believed the Meteor was ready for action against Germany's jets. With initial teething problems out of the way, they began to be deployed over Europe. In the end, there was no jet versus jet fighting in World War II. The only fighter versus fighter encounter the Meteors engaged in was an inconclusive fight against a group of Focke-Wulf FW-190s. Good planes, but not the technological marvels everyone had feared. And let's not forget the airfields that planes operated from. At the start of the war, there were very few airports that could support military operations. Throughout the war, aerodromes were rapidly constructed all over participating nations. Many of these became civil aviation bases after the war heralding the move from flying boats for long-haul operations to modern land planes. Fast and relatively cheap air travel has become accessible to almost everyone, no matter where in the world you are coming from or going to, and it is easy to forget the price that was paid by those who made it possible. The modern air traveler is often quick to anger when flights are delayed or cancelled because we somehow assume that on-demand service is owed to us. But the next time you find yourself venting your frustration on an airline employee or some unforeseen technical problem that keeps you waiting, just think of this quote by John Maxwell Edmonds as inscribed on the Westbury Memorial. When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow we gave our today. RAF Bomber Command air crews suffered an extremely high casualty rate. Of a total of 125,000 air crew, 57,250 were killed. That's a 40% death rate. A further 8,403 were wounded in action, and 9,838 became prisoners of war. Therefore, a total of 75,446 airmen, 60% of operational airmen, were killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. On average, 6,600 American servicemen died per month in World War II. That's about 220 a day. By the end of the war, over 40,000 airmen were killed in combat theaters and another 18,000 wounded. Some 12,000 missing men were declared dead, including a number liberated by the Soviets but never returned. More than 41,000 were captured. Half of the 5,400 held by Japanese died in captivity, compared with one-tenth in German hands. Total American air combat casualties were pegged at 121,867. And every one of the British and American airmen that were lost were flying and fighting in aircraft that were built with technological advancements that are still part of modern air travel as we know it today. They were the brave and courageous flyers who suffered the pain of progress.